Well, thanks, Marlene. I'm uh, pleased to be here. I have a uh, I have a lot of material to get through. I'll go through it as quickly as I can, but I, but there is uh, quite a bit of uh, quite a bit of slides, and I hope that everybody can see them. I'm okay. Um, there's a, a part of this presentation that just deals with zoning and form-based codes, and then there's a part of it um, that uh, deals with transportation issues in particular, and some of the new thinking and uh, practice that's going on in the world of transportation uh, design, and then ultimately sort of how that ties back to uh, regulations uh, as they're evolving in uh, communities, and I think as some of you have already done, and uh, what, I, what I anticipate more of you will be doing in the future. So uh, it's also fun to have uh, Scott and Lawrence up here with me. It's a great, uh, especially with Scott, because you know we did a code for Blue Springs, and now he has an opportunity to tell you the things that didn't work, uh, which is always great. Great to hear in person. But, <laughs> oh, and all the things that did work, of course. So uh, and this is a, everything uh, you know dealing with this kind of practice is is an evolution, and uh, I think Lawrence will also share a very interesting perspective to talk about some of the different tools that that they've used in Mission and how they relate to, to either form-based codes or design guidelines. And uh, you know, from, certainly from his perspective as a planning commissioner, uh, what, what tools are, are right in, in the right circumstance. So uh, I'm gonna kick it off here and talk uh, a little bit about uh, zoning first and form-based codes. I know you had a speaker last week um, who talked quite a bit about zoning. Uh, and uh, I'll, hopefully I don't regurgitate uh, everything he said here in the beginning. But, but I think it's important to sort of set the table for why we are even talking about this animal called form-based codes uh, at all. What, what, what is the deal with this? Why is this an emerging practice within uh, the planning profession? Um, by the way, uh, we also, I think the three of us have a number of resources that we brought with us here up at the front table uh, that you're free to take a look at. Uh, this, this book in particular is uh, a very good book that's uh, about a year old. That's called Form-Based Codes. The authors are Dan and Karen Parolik and Paul Crawford. Uh, you notice if you page through there that there's actually the Blue Springs code is cited uh, as, an, as a, a small case study in there. Uh, but there are a number of examples of different types of codes and approaches to doing four base codes from around the country, places that have been implemented in the last five years. We also have a copy of the Blue Springs code here as well, as well as a couple of others that uh, are in progress. And then uh, this, this one small piece here that I brought with me is something we just finished for the city of Panama City Beach in Florida. And this was really more of a document to create the impetus for uh, their community to do a form-based code. It's really more of an educational document that talks about what it is, why uh, the citizens of Panama City Beach should, would be interested in doing it in their community, and then looks at some specific site examples and some of the potential outcomes in, in a very sort of theoretical way uh, with some drawings, but also back up about how a code could potentially work. Uh, so this, this may be an interesting document for some of you, especially looking at a smaller community uh, and, and how uh, this code could work uh, in such a place. So I'm gonna talk uh, quite a bit about I hope I know some of you are here from uh, uh, some from quite large cities, some of you from very small ones, and we think that these tools have applicability really regardless of the city size, but I'll talk a little bit about how the tools might work differently depending if you're, for example, in Pleasant Hill versus, you know, if you're in Oakland Park. There's, there's probably a very different approach that you would take and a level of detail uh, that you would get into. So uh, oftentimes, you know, I like to start, this, this is an actual chart on the right from a local community on their development flow uh, chart, their development uh, approval process. And actually that's only half of it. So I had to cut it off so you could even get a sense for what this is at all. But we have a, a variety of approaches to sort of zoning in our communities that are, that are typical today. The most common are sort of basic open zoning districts, R1, C2, I1, M1, whatever they are, that, that basically um, have some very limited rules on what you cannot do, uh, but don't really always say what you can do. It's basically, you know, those districts are basically crafted on whatever the last project was that everybody hated. So, you know, if there was something that everybody really hated, then we'd create, you know, a new paragraph that amends it to say, don't do that again. But it's not very prescriptive. It doesn't really tell people exactly what you want to do. Oftentimes, uh, communities get frustrated with that open zoning 
So then they, they put in place uh, discretionary design guidelines as, as a layer on top of that to say, well, we're, we're, we don't really like the basic rules. They're too flexible. They're not specific enough. So we're going to put in place some, some design guidelines and set up probably a review board who will uh, interpret those. Um, but oftentimes they're just guidelines or suggestions and they don't really have the force of law. Sometimes they're very, very arbitrary in their definition. So they, you know, they have a place, but they can also be problematic in how you work through them. And then, you know, another practice that really evolved over the last you know, 30 years or so is the plan district or the PUD. And that was, again, a response to the fact that uh, so many of our open zoning districts just weren't really getting um, the community what they wanted from a planning perspective. And so we created tools to allow developers to have a tremendous flexibility in what they might want to do on a, on a larger project. Um, but, but it does presuppose a, a fairly long, oftentimes, negotiation process with staff, with uh, planning commission, with city council, so that it, you know, it, it's, as a developer wants to do something flexible, that there's the trade-off is that the city is provided with some certainty of a level of quality as, as to what that project will be. But it's a very highly negotiated process. Um, Form-based codes have a very different approach. Um, and that is the idea that we're going to code for a specific result. Yes, this is the watch out. It's the, the developers coming to land here in the colonies. But um, the basic idea, the number one most important thing that I would like to get across when you're doing a form-based code is it's done to implement a plan that is specifically written, you're specifically writing a code to implement a plan. So a master plan at some scale. That might be a comprehensive plan. Okay, when we talk about plan, oftentimes most of us think about comprehensive plan. Okay, but you know, depending on the size of your city, <coughs> if you're a very small city, a comprehensive plan can actually be quite detailed and specific. If you're a very large city, if you're open park, if you're in the city, if you're independent, it's a lot more generic. It's a lot more about policy statements and sort of big picture items and less about sort of, we're gonna do this particular thing in this neighborhood. But form-based codes are generally done to implement a specific master plan for a given neighborhood. And we'll talk about that as we get through it. So it's a different mindset because we're going to write rules that are specifically for what you want. And that's what comes out of the planning process versus you know writing for things that you don't want and hoping for the best. Uh, so the basic idea again is prescribing versus proscribing. So the basic idea is instead of you know going to the doctor and saying you know the doctor says to you well um, I don't know what you have but take these four pills and, and you know we'll see if any of them work. That's proscriptive. Going to the doctor and the doctor says I know exactly what's wrong with you. Here's this pill. Take it. You'll get better. That's prescriptive, and that's the difference. Where we're actually being very specifically saying, this is what will be done in this particular area. 